I'd like to say uh, thank, thank you to Lloyd and the Construction Authority Board for giving us the opportunity, I think. Um, everyone on the panel is really looking forward to uh, talking about the projects and, and where, where they're situated now. Um, as, as Lloyd mentioned, my name is Nathan Nicholas. I'm a policy advisor for the governor. Um, on the panel, we have closest to me, Tom Nelson, who's trading and revenue management from Cloud Peak Energy, and I have, we have Everett Keying, who's the President and CEO of Amber Energy, and we have Dex Sloan, who's the Senior Vice President and of Strategy and Public Policy for Arch Coal. We have uh, Joe Ritzman, who's the Vice President of Business Development for um, SSA Marine, and then uh, at the end, uh, Brett Porter, Director of Coal Marketing for BN Railroad. So, um, Andy hit most of the topics that uh, I wanted to talk about in terms of the foreign market, so I think we can, and he did a better job of it than I would, and his charts are a lot nicer than mine. So, um, as, as he mentioned, there's really only five countries that carry the lion's share of, of Seaborne coal. Um, you have Colombia, with, which are the green arrows, um, Russia, which are the blue arrows, and then South Africa, and then the bulk of it comes from Indonesia and Russia. What we're focusing on now is the, the pink arrows, specific, specifically out of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and why are we talking about this? Well, as, as we mentioned, domestic coal demand is the lowest it's been in 24 years. Uh, internationally, though, the, uh, the market is growing at between two and two and a half percent a year. And coal is the second largest energy source globally and domestically follow, or following behind petroleum. You can't talk about coal without talking about China. Seven years ago, China was a net exporter of coal. Uh, this year, China imported 360 million tons. They have 558 gigawatts of new coal generation in the works. And um, this has created a lot of uncertainty in the region, not only um, from the suppliers, but also from the consumers, those of the smaller governments, such as uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. And when we talk about energy, po energy poverty, um, Governor and Andy mentioned that over a billion people live in energy poverty now. When you talk about, depending on what your definition of, energy, of extreme poverty is, 60 to 80 percent of that population exists in India and China. So, the, as Andy mentioned, the electrification will happen. It's inelastic, and uh, how can PRB coal serve that that demand? Uh, this is just a map of some current ports that. Uh, are exporting uh, coal. We talk about the Pacific Northwest, um, but there's also up north in British Columbia, and then three developments in Washington and Oregon, which I'll let these gentlemen discuss. And then I threw a, a marker down in Louisiana just for a placeholder. Because I think it's interesting when we talk about the Pacific Northwest, and these are general, this is real general mileage, but to export from the PRB to the Gulf of Mexico and through the Panama Canal, you're looking at about 13,000 miles um, to get to South Korea. And that includes an additional five days in the Panama Canal. And I've heard some people say it can cost around $100,000 per day just in additional costs to get through the Panama Canal. That's not including the mileage. Uh, to go to India uh, from the Gulf is about 16,000 miles. So again, it's a huge distance. But when you talk about getting to Seoul, for example, from the Pacific Northwest, it's really only about 6,000 miles. So half the distance. Uh, I think Brett can talk about a little bit more about the rail distance, but it's probably two-thirds of the rail distance 
what it takes to get down to New Orleans. Um, so here's the current proposed Pacific Northwest ports. Uh, the green is Port Morrow, which is an amber energy development. The purple is Millennium Bulk Terminals, which is a uh, joint venture between amber and arch coal. And then the red is Gateway Pacific Terminal, which is uh, SSA Marines development. And then the two blue dots are um, West Shore Terminal and uh, Fraser Surrey Docks, which are currently exporting coal and taking about three to four million tons of PRP coal now. So the current proposed Pacific Northwest ports, I kind of covered these a little bit, and uh, but on the right hand column you can see they're all kind of in the same permitting scoping period. Um, the Port of Morrow specifically is a barge tra transload operation, barge transload, so they'll load it onto a barge and take it down the Columbia River and load it into a shipping vessel. Um, and then there were three other ports that were proposed that have all been dropped. In the, within the last 18 months for various reasons, primarily because of regulatory uncertainty. Um, I think these guys have covered the PIS scoping a lot better than I will, but um, generally speaking, it's a joint uh, scoping permitting process between the U.S. Corps of Engineers and the Washington State Department of Ecology. Um, but they split about a year ago somewhat because the Corps of Engineers wanted to conduct a focus study uh, based under the NEPA process only to include the proximate impacts of the projects. Uh, Washington determined, decided that they wanted to do an extremely broad CEPA process that would include impacts, um, environmental impacts starting in the PRB and all the way to uh, consumption in China. Uh, the governor uh, as you mentioned at lunch, is common on a, lot of, on a lot of this. He supports a full and focused NEPA process. If there are approximate issues to the projects, they need to be addressed, and he agrees with that. Um, however, it's inappropriate and unprecedented to examine issues that are so broad they become speculative. Uh, this doesn't take into account the technology, where the coal is going to be consumed, and in fact, bulk of the first shipments of cola won't actually make it to China, they'll actually end up in Taiwan, Korea, and Japan. And then uh, the NEPA process needs to be objective, it needs to be scientific, fact-based, and the, uh, the broad CEPA process is, seems to be oriented toward, toward a predetermined result. So what has the governor done uh, up till now? He's waiting on projects with numerous letters and conversations. Um, the legislature has made funds available for uh, coal port projects um, through, to be used in several avenues, including uh, travels to the West Shore Terminal, the Port of Gladstone, uh, to understand where those, uh, how those ports operate and what the issues are there in development and expansion. And then uh, a lot of international outreach, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan have been identified as priorities um, by the governor. Um, <clears throat> they are business-friendly uh, governments that have a high, have a great track record in terms of their environmental um, concerns. Uh, these these three countries also have a high demand. Um, and they're extremely interested in access to North American coal. It's become an issue of national security um, and energy security for these uh, countries as, as coal becomes harder to come by in the Pacific. Um, and then the, uh, the biggest hurdle we have now uh, from the governor's office is helping these foreign governments understand how to navigate the um, extremely complex permitting process we have in United States, the, the difference between state and federal permitting regulation is, uh, is confusing to them.
And so we've been uh, working with them for that. And then also local education. In fact, uh, today and tomorrow, Northeast Wyoming municipalities is hosting familiarization tours where they're hosting uh, elected officials from the Pacific Northwest to come out and understand how the PRB operates and uh, the environmental track record we have in Wyoming, which we're extremely proud of. Um, that's all I have. So at this point, I'd like to uh, turn over to Tom and get some comments from uh, members of the panel. And then, uh, I'd like to open it up for uh, questions and conversation. If, uh, I'd like to keep it an open forum so we can, you guys have the opportunity to learn the key issues that you'd like to learn. So. Thank you for uh, having me here to the uh, this forum. I think it's very useful um, and inviting uh, Cloud Peak. Um, to start out with, I just wanted to show everybody this picture. This is actually uh, the West Shore Terminal in Vancouver, uh, Washington. Currently ships about 33 uh, million metric tons per year of uh, U.S. coals, a little over 10 million tons. What's interesting about this uh, picture, I just want to point this out, it can load two vessels at the same time, one large vessel here at the bottom on my tax, and then another vessel here over on the right, kind of on the bottom, you can see it can load Pamex and a Cape at the same time. Um, kind of an interesting project, it also is, uh, can do containers as well, but it was actually built on the island, so, um, currently facility that's exporting coal right now out of the U.S. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, Cloud Peak Energy. Um, most of you probably know who we are, but uh, we produce about 70 million tons out of the PRP, about 20 million tons out of uh, Montana, so in total, about 90 million tons in total. Uh, pure PRP producer, um, and we employ about 1,700 people between uh, Montana, Wyoming, and probably about 100 people in uh, Colorado. Now, market cap, you can see about a little over a billion dollars. Um, the one thing that we did talk about quite a bit when we do stuff, and Nathan mentioned as well, uh, we are large open pit mines. Um, we're very proud of our stewardship. We have um, very environmentally sound. Um, we try to take care of the land as well. Uh, the second thing we like to focus on a lot is safety. Uh, this is based off of Inshaw mine data off of 2012. It shows basically we're at the, the low end of the, the thing. Uh, I don't know if many of you heard today there was an accident on Highway 59. It's a mountain road that runs south of Gillette. Anyway, there's a cruise ship thing that happened and highway construction going on and one of the crew buses actually ran in the back of several vehicles this morning. Well, there's actually three fatalities on that. Um, one of the fatalities was one of our electricians coming home at night, so kind of a sad day for us. Um, we've actually kind of shut down our Cordero Rural mine for the day. So um, we're actually very focused. We want our employees to get home even on the, on the drive. So. Um, uh, these things happen, so I'm not sure about the other two fatalities or injuries, but um, very sad day for us. Um, this shows our lines in PRB, and I talked a little bit about them. Um, Antelope, which is our further south line, 8800 type product. Um, and then Cordero Rojo, which is an 8400 type product. And then you can see up in kind of Montana, and kind of lower part of uh, Wyoming there. We have this sort of the Spring Creek, Young's Creek area complex. But in total, between all of that, a little over proven and probable reserves of over a billion tons, but we also have uh, of reserves that are sitting there almost double that of other reserves. So uh, if Andy's projections on demand are somewhat accurate, um, you know, we're, we're opposed for the development, we have coal reserves ready to go. 
Um, over the last five or six years, you can kind of see our demand. The gray area is kind of our domestic uh, coal that we ship. Kind of, it's relatively flat. It's gone down the last couple of years because of the domestic market. But you can see export wise, we've shipped about four or five million tons into the Asian market. Um, Stays pretty consistent. Um, besides shipping and in export into Asia, uh, Cloud Peak, we ship, we export into Canada as well. We last year we exported coal into Mexico. Um, and in the Asian markets, we shipped to, last year we shipped to Korea, South Korea, uh, Japan, China, um, Taiwan, Thailand. So uh, there's quite a few markets that we hit. Uh, this is kind of our, our strategy. I won't, I won't get into it too much. But just to say that uh, domestically, we see the market is, is relatively challenging. But we have uh, good assets. We think will survive any kind of downturn in the market. Uh, customers like them; they're low cost, and they'll survive. Um, and then we focus a lot on the export markets. Um, a lot of that is more on the Montana part, going uh, to the West Coast. But we're focusing on that. And you can see a map, kind of like made the map earlier, but it's got. The rail lines on it, you can see where our lines are relative to the, the, the ports. I, don't know, I won't talk about the other ports, I'll let these guys talk about the, their projects. But you can see where we ship to uh, West Shore, you can see Neptune and, and Ridley's up there on top of these existing facilities as well. And then the, the existing uh, rail lines that uh, get close to the port. Our, our current uh, port capacity, which I mentioned already, West Shore. We have a, a, a long-term agreement through 23 with these guys, um, and four to five million tons a year, we sign these type of agreements. Uh, and then the proposed project, which Joe is gonna talk about on the, uh, the Gateway project, we have a throughput option agreement there, about 16 million metric tons a year, we have a go. And then there's, we spent a lot of time Working on the, on the regulatory side, there's a lot of uh, groups opposed to our projects and stuff like that. So we, we spent a lot of time on this. Um, I won't go into it too deep. I'm sure Deb will get into it a little more than I will. But um, we put a lot of energy into this and, and trying to get the correct message put out there instead of the negative message. And I, I just wanted to kind of finish up with this, uh, this picture. It's actually a, a real power plant. It's not a painting. It's not um, some made-up thing. This is actually the Dengton uh, power plant in South Korea. It's owned by uh, EWP. It, it, it's basically the older units, which are down here on the bottom side, are about a little over 10 years old. The two kind of the top unit up there, they're new um, power plant. They're being, being built. 2,000 uh, megawatt units, ultra supercritical power plant they're being built. They build everything with the best technology at the time, most efficient, um, best technology, they, they do whatever they can. We don't have anything for uh, CCS yet, but um, if it was developed and they could put it in, it makes economic sense they would do it. Um, Andy talked a little bit about the demand growth in um, China a lot. We focus a lot into Korea, uh, a lot into Japan, um, <coughs> into Taiwan. We actually do sell some coal into China. Um, but these markets need our coal as well. They want us as a trade partner. Um, they like the U.S. Um, the, the things that we bring to the table that they like. Um, one, we're a good trade partner. We're reliable. They like our coal for diversification. Um, besides taking Indonesia coal and Australia coal. And another thing they like, they like the consistency of our product. So when they, when they actually go out and buy coal, they get what they said they're gonna get. That matters a lot to them. And they do get a lot of coal from Indonesia that doesn't come into the spec that they want, so it creates issues with them. So what they do with their coal when they do get it, this actually has two unloaded facilities and it has the different piles of coal. So 
They know what coal they want when they buy it, so they put it in that pile, so they'll blend it when they put it into the boilers. So if you give them the spec they want, they know how to blend it, they get the performance they want. Um, a question was asked to Andy about the type of units that are going to be built. Well, the Koreans actually build units that burn probably like a 54, 5300 um, NAR uh, CB type coal, which our coal on a Spring Creek type coal on an NAR type basis is about 4900. But what they do is they'll blend it with an Australia type coal. So that's what they do. They design these coals to take multiple type coals into it and uh, blend it and get the performance that they want. Um, we were just over there a month ago when we were at this power plant. We're at the Brawl Young power plant and it looks exactly like this one. And it consumes about 20 million tons a year. But the one thing it had that was just amazing that you'll never see in the U.S. had a visitor center that was very uh, technology based and very up to date and very fun. So once you go in there and you actually look at this and what they're trying to show people is what their power does for them. And it shows if you want to run your iPad, you can turn this thing for a long, how much energy that requires and how much energy um, these power plants put out. So they're, they're very energy conscious, they're very environmentally aware of what they're doing and they're trying to do the right thing. So I just wanted to end with that picture. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. I had the opportunity to see a visitor Korean power plant, not that one in particular, but uh, very remarkable facilities. Um, next, I, I think, Deck. Yeah, Deck, you're up. With, uh, Well, thanks so much for that, and um, very much appreciate being here. Uh, I want to first really thank the governor for the tremendous work that he's done on this issue. And Darren, thanks for, or Nathan, sorry, thanks for your, your good efforts uh, on that front. I want to thank uh, the Wyoming Construction Authority for, for, for their efforts, and Lloyd for, for his leadership. So it's a great forum. I'm pleased to be here, and great to be with my distinguished panelists. There are perils, however, uh, associated with appearing with the panel, uh, and that comes with the fact that a lot of stuff gets covered before you actually make it up to the, the diet. So that is the case, but you know, I spend a lot of my time analyzing markets both globally and, and domestically, so I'm not going to be able to refrain from jumping uh, in the fray and, and talking a little bit about why we think there's such an exciting story in Asia for U.S. coals and why, despite some of the, the challenges the challenges that exist today, you know, we really do anticipate that there's going to be a significant market. It's tough today. It's going to be better, I think, tomorrow. And so we'll talk a little bit uh, about that fact. I certainly want to start by, by talking about Arch Coal and give you a little profile of Arch. And I'll start in the east and, and move to the west. Uh, we're the second largest U.S. coal producer. We're a, we're a top ten producer globally from a volume perspective. So we're producing around 140 million tons annually. Uh, we have a, a Mainly in Appalachia, our focus is on metallurgical coal, so we're producing coal for steel making and exporting a fair amount of, of that production. We also have assets in, in Illinois as well as in Colorado, but certainly from a volume perspective, the centerpiece of our operations are, are right here in, in, in Wyoming. We're producing more than 100 million tons in our Black Thunder and our Coal Creek mine. Um, you know, certainly want to, to echo uh, and, and send out our, our thoughts. Uh, to some of our employees and, and their families and others who were affected by, by the accident today. So uh, it, is a, it is a sad day. Um, you know, I don't, I, I, you know, a guy who grew up in Kentucky can't come out and tell you guys that there's, you know, tell you about coal reserves uh, and how much coal there is in Wyoming because you all, you know that. But one thing I do want to point out is, you know, Wyoming, the BRB really is unique. Yes, you know, we all know it's a, it's a big reserve. But other than Mongolia, you don't get many 80-foot thick coal seams. Uh, you know, 100 billion tons of reserves, contiguous, one thick contiguous seam or two, depending on, on the split. So it really is a remarkable asset. I think that's important to recognize. Yes, Asia is a long way away. Yes, you have to haul the coal you know, to the coast, and put it in a seaborne vessel, and then haul it across the Pacific Ocean, which is a pretty sizable body of water. Nevertheless, because of the extraordinary nature of the RV, we really think that works. 
It's worked well in the last few years. Today it's a little bit challenging as we look out. We think that uh, the time will come again when that coal is getting pulled into the market. We do think there'll be a margin, an attractive margin to be had. Uh, we certainly think there's going to be significant demand uh, in Asia for that coal. So again, at the risk of flogging this dead horse, but to, 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 to look at it in a slightly different way, uh, if you look out over the past 10 years, we've seen coal consumption globally grow by about 55%. When you think about how big the industry is and how much coal is being consumed, that is really astounding, sort of meteoric kind of growth. Now, there are those who would say, yeah, 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 that's in the past. This is all about to come to a shuddering halt. And we would certainly uh, echo many of Andy's sentiments and say as well, Look, China has just crossed over 50% urbanization, going up to 70% over the next 20 years in all likelihood. Uh, I had a colleague who works for Shen Wang in the Chinese industry tell me recently that when a person moves from the countryside to the city, their energy consumption increases about fourfold. So when you think about that 10 to 15 million people making the migration to the city still, every year you realize that consumption is going to continue to climb. Yes, they're going to build hydro, and yes, they're going to build renewables, and yes, they're going to build nukes. And still, what they're going to build more of than anything else is coal, and I'll show you that. India, half of the schools in India today are not electrified. Half the hospitals in India today are not electrified. You know, the numbers we've heard, 1.3 billion people living in energy poverty, certainly accurate. Three billion people on the globe living without clean cooking facilities. So it tells you that it's not just that 1.3 billion, it's nearly half the globe who are using wood and dung to cook indoors and all the pulmonary issues that that represents. And to Tom's point earlier, absolutely we think Africa, eventually that's essential that Africa starts to develop. Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the worst, you know, one of the areas that is most deprived. Perhaps the water. I guess, you know, to, to provide some evidence to, you know, the fact that this growth is going to continue, you really just need to look at this slide, which will, which will tell you that, you know, as, as, as we speak today, you've got 200 gigawatts of new coal-based capacity that is going up right now. Real steel going to the ground. That's another 600 million tons of coal consumption. And there's an inevitability to that piece. You know, these plants, once they are completed, they will run. And, and, and right on the heels of that, another 225 gigawatts that is planned. That's another nearly 700 million tons of consumption. So in just between now and 2018, we're talking about adding the demand of the U.S. coal market in a period of five years. We know the U.S. coal market is, is enormous. So, you know, the, the, the idea that somehow this is all of a sudden peaking out and we're starting to see a decline again, I think this slide gives plenty of evidence that that's just fundamentally not the case today. Could it be post-2018? I guess. But there certainly is no evidence, as you see, got pretty much an unbroken straight shot of China and India of imports climbing and consumption climbing. And, and why that ends today, hard for me to figure out. Now you could say the rate of growth is going to slow. Certainly think that's entirely possible that we'll see a slowing or a rate of growth. But the base has gotten so much bigger. So if you think back to 2000, 2003, when China was consuming 1.3 billion tons of coal, 10% growth every year in GDP, equivalent sort of growth in energy consumption, translated into 130 million tons of coal, uh, incremental coal needs. Fast forward to today, 4 billion tons, even if that growth rate gets cut in half to 5%, we're talking 200 million tons. So 200 versus the 130. So even though the rate of growth might slow, in absolute terms, we actually think coal consumption is going to grow at a faster pace. And, and as is pointed out, and Andy again did a, did a great job on this, uh, yes, a lot of this coal is going to come indigenously, but we know well as producers that chewing through 4 billion tons a year does a number on your reserves. So what you're seeing is the Chinese production, for instance, is migrating to the north and to the west. Uh, and yes, they're running as hard as they can to try to keep pace. But to take that coal, from Xinjiang or from Inner Mongolia to Qinhuangdao, down the coast of the vessel to the, the industrial provinces, Guangdong, uh, is a big move. So logistically, we think they're going to continue to look at the seaborne market. Certainly India, which has 
coal quality issues there. They have lots of coal. It's not great coal. Um, there are coastal plants that are going to be much better served by the seaborne marketplace, and you can see that. But I would say, and this is a little different than Andy, if you focus only on China and India, and yes, they're going to be big, you're going to miss what's coming right behind. Because Southeast Asia is doing the same thing. And the IEA has just come out in the last week, actually November, with the World Energy Outlook, saying that Southeast, in Southeast Asia, coal consumption in the next 20 years is going to triple from 130 million tons to 400 million tons. So that may not sound like a lot compared to what we've seen from China. 270 million additional tons of coal demand is a lot. These are the countries that, that we know, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand. So we certainly think they're coming along. And then the, the developed world, uh, the develop, developed Asia. You know, Japan, who uh, post Fukushima is revisiting their energy needs, has just added two new coal units, South Korea. So we certainly think that this goes beyond China and India, although China and India are a big part of the equation. And I would also point out that, you know, at any point out, there is now a big sub this market. Uh, as you can see, in fact, Indonesia is exporting nearly 380 million tons of sub and low rank coals. That low rank coal, 174 million tons, is 8,100 BTU and below. So if you think about that, that's lower than anything in the PRB. So already, PRB relative to Indonesia has a quality advantage. When you look out to 2020, you can see that almost all the incremental growth is going to be in those lower rank coals because they're mining their existing bituminous reserves and their sub bituminous reserves aggressively. So the next increment is lower quality. So suddenly, PRB not only competes, it looks like rocket fuel compared to some of this stuff. And so as we look out, again, that's why over the next five to 10 years, you can't really look at it today. In fact, 10 years ago, you would have said, PRB exports, there's a lot of tunes, coal out there, closer to demand centers. Today, all of a sudden, you know, we realize how, how uh, realistic this is. We hear from Asian buyers all the time who are interested in, in Wyoming coals. But as you look out over the next five to 10 years, the picture gets better, not worse. And certainly port operators agree with all this. I mean, you know, if you look on the East Coast and the Gulf Coast, you can see that you know, we're adding port capacity very, very rapidly because those port operators want to participate in this story. Now, more of the growth is in the Pacific Rim, so the East Coast and the Gulf Coast don't help you as much. But certainly there are those in the Gulf Coast and in Houston who want to participate in this market. I do think the expansion of the Panama Canal matters. Yes, it's not as direct a move, but I think over time, uh, let's hope that's 2000 and the end of 2015 we see that expansion, but it will come. We think there's a real opportunity to move some tons through the Gulf and through the Panama Canal. Certainly, we're moving tons today, the RB tons today into the Atlantic Basin. But you can see they're all making a bet that U.S. exports over time are going to factor more significantly. But we would absolutely agree that we need to move some tons off the West Coast as well. That's simply logical to do that. Um, you know, uh, we certainly are spending a lot of time on those Northwest ports. Arch is an investor in Millennium. Um, Everett, I know, we'll, we'll talk about that. We're, we've invested a lot of energy. Uh, the interesting thing, I, at one point, I would make on the public uh, sort of affairs relations side. I'm glad to talk about that more um, uh, as we go, go through the Q&A session. Um, but, but the support for those, those ports in the Northwest is actually quite strong. And I think that's a surprise to people. It's sort of like, well, the Northwest has kind of weaned itself off of coal. They're not as, you know, they've got a lot of hydro. But in reality, every poll we do, to objective polls and every third party poll, shows that about, there's support for those polls for, for uh, exports out of the Northwest, coal exports out of the Northwest, about two to one. Those who have an opinion generally think it's a good idea. And it's not because they love coal. It's because they think trade is really fundamentally important to their economy. So that's the message we're trying to drive. And certainly we don't think, to the question earlier, that there is going to be more coal burn because of those ports. The, the people of Asia are getting on with their lives. They are moving forward and they're going to be reaching into Russia and they're going to be reaching into Indonesia and they're going to be reaching into Australia and Canada and South Africa for their needs as well as their own indigenous supplies. Um, they're not waiting around for us, but we can participate and certainly we're looking forward to that. In fact, let me just, uh, a couple more quick points here and then we'll uh, pass the baton. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the market, and, and the subject came up earlier. How important is the export market, PRB coal? And I would say certainly very important. It's a significant part of the growth. But I, I think, you know, I think it's important to disabuse people of the notion that somehow domestically we're not going to be burning PRB coal. You know, these are the major forecasts out there, including with McKenzie's. Uh, there may be a more up-to-date one, but 
but it shows you that in, in 2020 here in the U.S., the expectation is that there'll still be over 900 million tons of coal consumption domestically. That's about how much we used in 2013. So yes, we've seen demand flatten, but we're seeing some retirements of coal plants. We're going to we expect to see more. We certainly think there's going to be a solid market here. And in fact, uh, even with that 900 million tons being relatively flat, we think PRB consumption actually will grow about 50 million tons between 2013 and 2020. So there's a meaningful market. The Asian market is not the market of last resort, but it is a market that we think is going to be open to us. We think it provides a lot of growth, a lot of opportunity for the folks in Wyoming and for the industry, good for the U.S. and lots of ways. I guess the, the, the final point there would be, again, that, you know, the, the, uh, yes, Asia would love to have some U.S. coal. The diversification, the quality issues, it's, you know, it's a very low emitting, very attractive coal. I would love to see that in their, in their mix. The reality is, again, they are moving on, and uh, they are the primary driver on CO2. They're going to continue to use uh, lots and lots of fossil fuels. I don't think there's any serious energy forecast out there that suggests that by 2050, fossil fuels won't be the dominant source of, 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 uh, of, of the dominant primary energy source uh, globally. Uh, so, the coal's going to be consumed. The question is, do we want that activity here? And do we want to produce the coals where our mining uh, regulations, uh, the care with which we, 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 uh, we undertake that activity, our safety record is really better than anywhere else in the world, or do we want it somewhere else? Because again, uh, Asia will turn somewhere for their energy needs. So uh, again, glad to talk further about the ports, but I want to give you sort of the, our perspective on the case for why there's a, there's a compelling marketplace that's building out there for PRB coal, and uh, we'll pass it on over to uh, whoever's next, Evan, are you your position is if you're on it. Means anything. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the WIA board for having us here. It's uh, Amber Energy's pleasure uh, to participate in this. Lloyd, thanks for arranging this. This has been great. Um, I don't think there's a, a lot that I can say uh, that's going to improve on what Andy and others have already articulated in terms of what the business case is for why we're doing what we're doing. So, and I'm also uh, well aware that it's getting late, and so I'm going to speed through this, and I'm going to highlight, I'm going to try to highlight a few things that have been said and maybe just introduce a couple of things that haven't been said, and then tell you a little bit about Amber Energy and a little bit about the projects that we're involved in. Amber Energy is an Australian company uh, that is now headquartered in Salt Lake City, uh, but it started in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, we have about 350 employees that we manage in the U.S. Uh, the locations primarily are in the Pacific Northwest where the port developments that have already been identified. Uh, our Morrow Pacific project, which is Oregon, and the Millennium project that we are involved with jointly uh, with ours uh, is in Longview, Washington. Uh, we have talked about a tale of two worlds. One of the things that we have heard, and I think we've heard it repeatedly, is that there is energy poverty in the world. Uh, there is, depending upon the number that you want to settle in on, we've heard a billion, we've heard over a billion, I've seen billion two, I've seen a billion five. You know what, it's just a lot of people. Now, the other aspect of that is, it isn't going to stay that way. Because most of the projections are showing that the population from now, over the next 10, 20 years, are going to go to nine billion people. So it isn't that you can just hold your own. The other thing that we've heard is that location does matter. 75% uh, of that world population is going to be in Asia and Africa. So in terms of trying to fuel what's going to be necessary to fix what doesn't work today, it's just going to be exasperated to a greater extent with just normal progress and continued increase in the world population. Uh, the other thing that hasn't been heard today, and I've seen estimates, uh, and they're in the range of 35 to 40, and that number is a dollar number, and it's a trillion. Uh, that over the next 20 years, globally, 
uh, everybody trying to figure out how to essentially light the world, power manufacturing, do all of the things that's necessary to support that uh, a 9 million population is somewhere between 35 and 40 trillion dollars. And in terms of energy diversity and in terms of uh, international trade, we've talked a lot about uh, the, the business case of why this works. We've also talked a lot about China. Um, but in terms of the other Asian uh, utilities, um, there is something that's beyond just an economic consideration because everybody has to manage costs. But there's also a strategic implication because the one thing that you can't do is you can't fuel a coal-fired power generating facility without coal. You can find ways, and we've, we've heard that, we've talked about how you can use diversity, you can do blending, you can do different things that, that can average your cost down. Um, but if you don't have coal, you can't do those things. Um, our focus uh, has been on those Asian utilities, even though the growth isn't as monumental as what's being projected and talked about in China. There is a strategic importance, and those are favored trading regimes with the U.S. So BTUs are a, a, a tradable commodity. Uh, there are geopolitical implications of those countries not being able to continue to keep up with their growth, uh, develop and support the emerging middle class. Uh, in terms of manufactured goods, it has an implication for us. Uh, in terms of trade, it has an implication. So in some respects, um, we're, we're, we're a little bit of collateral damage in this because this is a classic textbook case of supply and demand that just have, happens to have global implications across a very long distance. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the USA profile. Everybody knows it. It, it really has been a tale of two worlds. I think it's been really great because throughout the day you've heard and we've focused a lot on the challenges of what the diversity and what the energy mix and what environmental issues and, and uh, climate control issues, depending upon on how you want to settle in on it. Um, uh, the governor, governor spoke very eloquently about what's happening with Wyoming, uh, how it's influencing what's happening in the U.S. And uh, we know what that profile is. We know what it looks like. We know where it's going. And now we've taken it into the international arena and we've seen a different thing that's going on outside of the country. Uh, outside of the country, I think the one thing that, that we all uh, have a common theme is that it will be on the back of coal because coal fire power is rapidly scalable. And in terms of the necessity to address uh, uh, the needs today, plus the emerging needs, uh, is, is going to require coal. Um, one of our biggest challenges is the Green Wall. Um, that's what separates uh, supply and demand. So uh, right now, uh, we've got a very willing seller and an extremely motivated buyer, and they're on both sides of one constraint. So our efforts are focused very heavily in the Pacific Northwest trying to figure out how to do and get the permitting that we need to develop the port terminals uh, that will uh, essentially move this coal uh, from a, a, a willing buyer uh, to a motivated seller. Just uh, uh, expectations, um, I'll just focus on this. Our Morrow Pacific project, which I'll talk a little bit about, was supposed to be a sprint. It, if Millennium and other things could be uh, characterized a little bit more as a marathon, uh, we thought because of size and scale, and we also thought because of the proximity of Port Morrow, uh, being some 800 miles as opposed to double that distance uh, from the southern PRB or from the PRB uh, to get coal by rail into a barge that could go by water uh, into a transloading operation. And by size and scale, I mean that operation uh, did not require a full environmental impact statement. It required an environmental assessment. All of those things were done. That's the one that's getting the most attention right now. It's the one that, that we spend the most time on because it is immediate. It's at a point where it receives some permits for construction. Uh, it's under attack uh, in a lot of different ways. It, it had the uh, ability 
to, uh, let me go to this. Uh, it had the ability quickly uh, to provide a diverse set of coals into a diverse market. Uh, and it was scalable, and it would start out at somewhere around three to three and a half million tons a year, metric tons, and work up to about eight to nine million metric tons. Um, we envision, if you, if I went back to the timeline, but I won't take the time to do it, that with the permits this year, and with the uh, construction and the commitments that were necessary, that by next year, Fort Morrow uh, would be shipping coal. Uh, the Millennium Project, Larger scale, uh, it has a phase, a phase one of 25 million uh, tons per year and a phase two that takes it up to 44 million tons per year. It is in the EIS process. Um, uh, it, it, it will go through a complete and thorough review. Uh, just to that point, the, the process, uh, the NEPA and SEPA process, the way it, it has been defined and designed and used does it precisely what it was intended. Uh, it fully vets all of these projects based upon project-specific criteria. Some of the issues or the challenges that we have is when the agencies decide that beyond their jurisdiction or because of overreach, that that isn't sufficient because of the commodity that's involved. And uh, we push back really hard on that because projects uh, have been and, and should be permitted on project-specific criteria and not the commodity that's involved, nor should it be involved uh, in terms of what the ultimate use of that, that commodity is going to be at its destination. I think that's a slippery slope. And once you start down that, you, you're not going to confine that uh, to just coal. The Millennium Terminal is over 400 acres. It's an ex-aluminum smelting site. Um, it's being repurposed. It is a brownfield site. It has about a mile and a half of aquatic uh, lease uh, on the Columbia River on the Washington side. Um, it has an existing berth. Uh, it is an operating port. Uh, so that is uh, a picture of, of the Millennium Port in a very heavily industrialized area that, for the most part, if you stand out on that berth and you look up and down the road, you will see other ports doing precisely what we intend to do, only they're doing it with something that's not coal. Port Morrow. Port Morrow was a two-stage process. It was to rail coal to, uh, to uh, Port Morrow in Oregon, on the, on the Oregon uh, side of the river. It would transload into a barge. The coal would be barged to Port Westward, still on the Oregon side of the river, not go back into a stockpile, but just be uh, transshipped into an ocean-going vessel at that point, and then out. Uh, just quickly, uh, Amber Energy also is a joint venture partner with Cloud Peak Energy and the Decker Mine 50-50. Uh, uh, Amber Energy also manages and uh, takes care of the joint venture of the Black Butte Mine uh, just east of Rock Springs. Uh, the joint venture partner there is Anadarko. Uh, this is a, a, a quick snapshot. Uh, I don't think there's anything that requires any explanation here. Uh, the demand is extraordinary. It's a demand pull. The customers are already there. Uh, it is a desirable call. Um, the challenge is to get the permits and get the ports built, get them opened up, and uh, use the, the economic incentives that are provided by this to be able to move coal from the PRB uh, into the Asian Pacific Rim. Uh, these are websites where you can find more information about AMBER. Uh, Millennium, our Mara Pacific project, and then the alliance is CreateNorthwestJobs.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon to all, and. Uh, a particular note of thanks to Lloyd uh, for the invitation to be here today and also to the board of WIA. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll uh, get right into my presentation. Uh, but obviously, Andy um, laid out a very compelling case uh, on the demand side. We've heard from the producers, uh, the supply is there. So uh, what I'd like to present today is sort of what is the missing piece, and that is connecting the supply and demand on the West Coast uh, with port infrastructure. 
So using the Vapor project as an example, I'd like to uh, impart what it might look like, where it would be located, the type of review process uh, that uh, we're currently undergoing, and give you a sense of some of the challenges uh, and the timeline. Uh, so I'll hit uh, these items, get a little bit into the NEPA versus SEPA, and explain uh, how the state and the federal government have taken a very different approach on the permitting. Uh, I'd like to explain some of the consequences of the broad SEPA scope, uh, which have impacts, of course, right back here to Wyoming. Uh, I appreciate uh, your governor understands these issues very well. Um, and uh, before that, I just have two slides on our company so you understand who we are. Uh, SSE Marine, uh, unfortunately, have been defined by this project as being a, the coal company, but we, uh, we're a port operator. Uh, we're a fairly, fairly large company with a global footprint. Uh, founded in Bellingham, which coincidentally is the location of the proposed gateway to the terminal project uh, in 1949. We're now under the third generation of successive family management, and over uh, that 60 some year period, have developed from a small, basically stevedore handling logs in Bellingham, <coughs> one of the world's largest uh, marine terminal operators. Um, I've been with the company 15 years and have had the, the, the distinct pleasure uh, of working on port infrastructure projects. Uh, in places throughout the world where uh, putting, um, you know, water port infrastructure in place to facilitate export and economic development uh, has been very well received, but we're uh, throughout most of Latin America, we have a footprint in Asia, we do handle some coal uh, in South Africa, and we're also uh, in New Zealand. So uh, I think it, what we're saying is this is a company with a track record of developing big projects, has the resources uh, and the experience uh, to do so. Um, we are uh, throughout the supply chain. This here is just an indication of some of the services we provide. Carex is our uh, parent company, or the beholding company of the three uh, operating <coughs> subsidiaries, the three main operating <coughs> subsidiaries SSA Marine, the port operator developer, and a sponsor of Gateway Pacific Terminal Project. Um, so we handle uh, on the US West Coast about 10 million 20 foot containers a year. So. That's about one in four containers that come over the U.S. West Coast. We handle in uh, Southern California, Oakland, or the Pacific Northwest. So there's a good chance the shoes you're wearing or the electronics in your home or other items, uh, we, we've handled them. Uh, and then our sister company, RMS, uh, transfers those multimodally from the dock side to unit trains, and uh, we handle about 9 million rail TEUs per year. Uh, our third operating unit that's of uh, note is a software company called Tideworks Technology. Tideworks uh, plans the terminal operating system. So how do you figure out uh, on the terminal where a container gets stowed on a ship, or who's supposed to pick it up, or is it hazardous and it's weight? All of those attributes. Um, we have a software company that um, develops a proprietary system for, for managing all that. Okay, so to the project. Uh, this project is proposed to be up in Whatcom County which is in northwest Washington state. It's the most northwest uh, county in the state. It borders British Columbia to the north. Um, and um, you can see in the pea green uh, there, um, the pea green area there is the Cherry Point Heavy Industrial Zone. The first slide I should like to go back to really quickly, I should mention that this project is being proposed in the existing heavy industrial zone. Our project footprint is the green part of the middle for the most part. Our neighbors are BP, an existing oil refinery, uh, ConocoPhillips, and the third industrial pier you see uh, is in Talco, which is an aluminum smelter. So this project uh, is proposed to be in a site that was set aside for this specific type of industry, zone for heavy industry. It's got heavy industry um, utilities, uh, rail connection, and uh, perhaps one of the best attributes about it, it has naturally deep water. So 80 feet of naturally deep water means no dredging required to get cape sized vessels in. Uh, as Andy has explained, those uh, vessels bring down the unit cost of, of, of the coal and make it more competitive on the national market. Um, the capacity would be 54 million metric tons. Uh, what's a little bit different about this project is we propose to set aside 6 million tons uh, of capacity for non coal products. So we're talking about potash. Uh, talking about grains, et cetera, but 48 million tons uh, would be set aside for coal. Um, real quick timeline there, we filed a permit in February of 2011. So uh, here we are in May of 2014, and 
Essentially, we've just gotten the EIS document underway, and I'll have a slide to describe the steps uh, and where we are now. We expect um, a draft of that document uh, in the first quarter of the coming year. So if the current schedule holds, uh, we'll have a DEIS in Q1 2015. Uh, this is a schematic uh, of the or a surrendering of the project layout, and I'm so glad that Tom showed the picture of the West Shore, uh, which I wasn't going to do, but you can see that this facility is nothing like the current uh, West Coast terminal that's, uh, that's connecting the PRB coal to Asia. This facility, uh, unlike West Shore, which is right on the water, exposed to the elements, uh, and built on landfill, uh, this facility would um, only develop about 25% of our 1,500 acres. The other 75% would stay in the green buffer. Uh, there would be no cut required in the bluff. I mentioned no dredging. Uh, you can see those two rail service loops. One would bring uh, the non coal commodities uh, to recover the storage, to the grain elevators with the potash sheds, and the open storage there you can see would be for the coal. It's at half a mile away from the shore, uh, and we put a lot of thought into, our engineering team has put a lot of thought into designing this uh, in a way to protect the environment and, and meet Washington State's stringent environmental standards. So I think there's a strong case uh, to be made from the environmental side. If you're really concerned about um, protecting the environment, we should probably export our coal through a facility like this than one like Western, which is, uh, as I mentioned, um, exposed and uh, does not have some of these. I got an information packet, which um, uh, I've got a stack up on the table there. Uh, and it's got this infographic in it. We need you some time to go through it all. Uh, but it touches on the economic benefits of the project. Uh, we would create about 4,400 jobs during the construction phase. And we would create about 1,200 uh, jobs during the operation phase. Um, also notable on the infographic, Washington State is the most trade-dependent state in the country. One in four jobs are tied to trade. Uh, you think about Boeing and other big companies like that uh, and you can understand uh, how and why. I think declaration <coughs> to um, polling shows overwhelmingly over and over uh, support for these projects and it's because people in Washington uh, State understand the need to continue to invest in our uh, export infrastructure and so although uh, they might not be fans of coal, they certainly understand that our state uh, is trade dependent and in a global uh, competitive situation. So here's uh, a slide that shows the sequencing uh, of the environmental review uh, for Gateway. Uh, just one correction, Nate was saying that we're sort of in the scoping phase. The scoping phase was done in January of 2013. So that is in 2012, uh, the state made us go around and have seven public hearings and have people solicit their ideas. What should be studied in the IS? What should the scope be? So that was uh, done in 2012. The scope, uh, scoping period closed in January 2013. Um, and the actual scope came out in July of 2013, so about six months after the scoping window closed. At that point in time, the US Army Corps of Engineers and the Washington State Department of Ecology were co-leads that were working hand in hand uh, on the EIS document. But when the federal government realized what the state wanted to study, uh, they had a divorce, uh, and that occurred in July. And since then, um, the Corps has decided to do a, tradi a traditional site-specific review, whereas the state uh, has sort of set some new precedents, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, anyhow, so the EIS is being written now, and as I mentioned, we hope by Q1 of the coming year uh, to have the draft document ready, and that will go for public comment again. So important for folks to understand this isn't happening um, without public input. Stakeholders are being consulted and uh, we'll have another chance to give input on the draft. Uh, the draft will be finalized and hopefully we'll get a record decision late next year. So what happened uh, with the, I should call it the divorce uh, between the feds and the state? Um, and here on the right side you can see when the scope came out in July what the state of Washington and the Department of Ecology on the study, which were indirect impacts going all the way back to the mines for the rail, uh, indirect, indirect impacts of vessel traffic beyond Washington state waters, um, and perhaps most importantly, uh, this life cycle idea of greenhouse gas emissions from um, the mine to the plant. 
the uh, Army Corps of Engineer said um, that's beyond our jurisdiction uh, and we don't want any part of that. And so they split. So what's happening now is you have one EIS document, it should have a, a, a NEPA chapter that the Corps will um, oversee and a SEPA uh, component which our state will oversee. Um, but it really reinforces this idea that uh, the state has overreached uh, and it's really um, spawned some uh, unintended consequences. Uh, and it's very real that everyone uh, in this room should be concerned about it because uh, the scope for the GPT project has already shown up uh, in legal challenges to a project in Washington State for an oil terminal where uh, the case has been found where it's just the same, wait a minute, the scope for this project doesn't include life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see where that might lead if Boeing wants to expand or if any other industry in Washington wants to build a plant, what they're saying is that that would be the precedent. Very um, slippery slope, I think was referred to by one of my colleagues. Um, we know Wyoming is concerned about this uh, unprecedented scope, and um, we know the attorneys general of Montana and North Dakota have weighed in, and uh, some of the issues there that they've raised are really the the constitutionality of let's call it a global EIS, that is, if you're going to study the impacts on a global basis, um, what does that mean for interstate commerce? What does that mean um, for market access? Um, and is it constitutional vis-a-vis -vis the interstate commerce clause? So uh, these are some very um, large issues bigger than the project, but perhaps issues that might need to be resolved um, before uh, it's all done. Um, we've been very encouraged by support we've seen here coming out of Wyoming, your governor is a tireless advocate uh, of Wyoming coal. As Nate mentioned, he's traveling the world uh, promoting it. And uh, we're also uh, encouraged by uh, State Rep. Dave Miller and his initiative to try to set aside funds to either um, perhaps uh, litigate uh, where he was trying to slow up permits in Washington State or uh, perhaps uh, find an entity in Washington, excuse me, in Wyoming, a proper vehicle to build uh, more best in ports if the state of Washington uh, is going to make it difficult. So uh, we thank uh, for that support. Um, I'll just end with this picture, which is in uh, Australia at New Castle, and it really shows that uh, terminals can be good neighbors. You can see a very large neighborhood adjacent to this facility that handles 25 million tons a year, and we'd like to uh, show that as sort of an indication of uh, the compatibility of these terminals and you know, neighborhoods. Um, last thing I'll say is uh, I have a stack also of um, Keep Me Connected cards. If anyone would like to get on our email list, get updates on the permitting process or other updates, uh, you can also grab a, a card. So with that, I think we'll move on to Q&A and thank you.
Coal is very important for us. We've invested about $3.5 billion since um, 1996. So, you know, I think most people on the street, if you ask them where coal was as far as loadings go, they wouldn't say it's a fourth of our loadings, but it is. And our CEO talks quite a bit how important coal is to our franchise and how it's going to be an important part of the franchise 20 years from now. And that's how we invest our money in our coal franchise. I'm going to skip this one in the sake of time. So just to move on to Wyoming, and talk about how important Wyoming is to the BNSF. So uh, we have 1,300 employees in Wyoming. I don't know how many of you saw the rooms outside that had um, BNSF on the doorway. So we're actually interviewing here today for conductor trainees. So obviously, we, uh, I couldn't have timed that even better. Um, we're hiring 23 conductors today. So again, Wyoming, uh, you know, we're going to continue to grow our employee base up there as our volume continues to grow. If we, um, and we've invested, I guess, about $250 million in Wyoming in infrastructure in the last, in the recent years. So we look at this top right chart, the pie chart, that's the volume that is shipped out of Wyoming. So we did 1.7 million units last year of coal out of Wyoming. Obviously, that's the, the great bulk of the, the pie chart. The, uh, the, blue, the blue part of the pie chart is the industrial products. That's mainly crude coming out of Wyoming. And I'll talk a little bit about the growth in that in our network. Uh, as far as products coming into Wyoming by, by rail, um, really it's kind of a misnomer that 74,000 74, units of um, coal that's unloaded obviously is moved within the state of Wyoming going to Dave Johnson and Larry River. Um, but it's, it's a very important part of our franchise up here. And we also move quite a bit of other stuff in uh, Wyoming like drilling pipe and sand and, and fertilizer. So um, pretty important part of our franchise to come in about as well. And just to kind of talk about coal where coal goes, I think we all know this, but this is a the density chart of being a set that shows where our coal moves today. And the thicker the line, the more the volume. And obviously, you can look at this chart 2013 and see that our bread and butter is uh, moving from the PRB to the Midwest and to Chicago. That's where most of our volume goes. Um, and, you know, we see that continuing to, to be very uh, more stable than people think it's going to be for reasons that we're talking about today as far as the low cost of PRV and capacity factors being higher for some of the bigger plants. So we're, we're much more optimistic about the future of coal and why a lot of the eastern railroads are because of, because of PRV. And, uh, but the, the interesting thing on this chart, if you look up to the, the north and the west, we're actually moving coal into the northwest now. If you look five years ago, there wouldn't be anything on this, on this chart. So we are starting to see exports grow. And I'll, I'll get more into that in a little bit. Average coal sets in the service, we load about, on average day, we load about 47 trains out of PRB. So uh, we've really ramped up our coal sets in the last, in the last year. Um, a lot has been because of demand. Demand's been very strong. Some of it has been some of our velocity issues. We've had some challenges the last year with the volume and the weather. Um, but we're, we're working our way through that. But I think it shows how quickly we can ramp up, um, you know, equipment when we need to. And we've, we've done that in the last year. So this is a density chart for our industrial products business unit. And this is basically all the merchandise traffic. Um, the thicker, and this is just a change in our volume on the industrial products network since 2006. And 2006 is really an important year because that was our peak loadings on the BNSF. We loaded 10.6 million units in 2006. And so we kind of, right, we kind of measure everything against that high water mark. So the thicker the line, the more the volume has grown since 2006. And this is mainly the crude network. This is the crude that's grown on the BNSF. So you can see most of it really goes to the, to the, to the east. It goes to Chicago to go to the eastern refineries. But a lot more of it's going west now. So again, it's kind of the tail of, we're talking about exports. We've got a lot of stuff that wants to go west. And that, that line is continuing to grow. The interesting thing about crude network is we actually have, we have um, 21 unit unit trained crude loaders now in the United States. Obviously the Bakken Shell in North Dakota is kind of the epicenter for us. The Bakken Shell produces about a million gallons, a million barrels a day of oil today. Uh, 
you know, they're saying in three or four years it could be double that. But the whole shale revolution has been phenomenal to watch. We had 18, 18 shale plays in action right now in the NSF. And we have five unit trend orders in Wyoming. So we're continuing to see, we've got two more in development. So we're just seeing it's really easier to find a spot on the railroad where there's not a shale play as opposed to where there is a shale play. And for every well that's grilled, we move in about 40 units of inbound associated product the type, the, um, the sand, the, the mud, all that stuff. We, um, so it's kind of a two-way street, so we, um, you know, we take advantage of that as well. Um, but, you know, again, long story short, the crude play has really changed the, the BNSF network, and it really has just been a recent phenomenon in the last two years. But, it really goes in all directions. That's one of the unique things about unit trains of crude. It, there's a lot of arbitrage opportunity versus pipeline. We're you know, about three or four times faster than the pipeline. We also have, you know, you can maintain the product purity and crude um, by rail as opposed to pipeline. So we think there's a lot of selling points, obviously. This is our ag volume and same chart. Basically, it shows the growth. Um, since 2006, the thicker the line, the more the growth. And if you look at this, it's really kind of one story, right? It's all going to the Pacific Northwest. And we, um, you know, the governor being talked about, the growing middle class, and same thing for ag. You know, the, the, the better the middle class, obviously, the more people in the middle class, the more proteins they want, the better, um, the better diet they're going to have. And we, we believe that's going to continue to improve. So we, we see the P&W grain growth story being continued for the next you know, 15, 20 years at least. And the grain elevators in the Pacific Northwest are, are building additional terminal capacity or elevating capacity. They're building more tracks. So long story short, there's a lot of stuff that wants to move out west. So that's the, the challenge we have as a railroad. We talk about all these export terminals being developed. you got all the crew that's going to want to move west. We've got all the grain that wants to move west. So it's a, it's a big challenge for us. So how are we going to deal with that? That's a very relevant question. We're going to invest a lot of money, and that's really what it really gets down to. Is, um, if you look at our, our track from Chicago to Los Angeles, it's about 95% double track today. You know, two tracks where trains don't slow down, don't have to meet pass. They can go full speed without slowing down. Basically directional trains. Um, we're going to be doing the same thing in the north. If you look at our capital spend, we are, we're going to spend $5 billion this year in capital. It's a record spend. Last year was a record spend of $4 billion. So we, you know, we, um, we're going to spend a billion dollars more than last year, this year, on growing our network, on you know, additional infrastructure, being locomotives, equipment, um, you know, sidings, and yard capacity. So we're, we're spending a lot of money, and we think that's one of the good things that you look forward to the BNSF. We're, we're privately owned by, by Warren Buffett. Berkshire Hathaway. We don't have to have quarterly earnings reports, so we we spend like it's a family business. We look at it as if it's a hundred-year business because it, it really is for us. You know, the railroad's been around for 160 years, so we look at the the whole um, the coal export strategy. And we've got a long-term window on our commitment to it. We've got a long-term view that it's going to be a very substantial market for us. So um, this just kind of shows that we are willing to commit money where the growth is, and next year the money. Capital spending will be even larger. Other things we're doing to add capacity is we're adding people. We're hiring 5,000 people this year. And it's not people like me that sit around and, you know, send emails out all day. It's people that are actually moving the trains. You know, you saw it today, three free rooms that were hiring conductors today. But 5,000 new employees on the base of 42,000 employees. That's that's a big deal. So uh, we're going to continue to do that. Each of you know these conductors and, and engineers run our trains. It takes about six months from the time we hire them until the time they're actually you know qualified, certified, trained beyond the territory. So it's it's a big commitment for us, and we believe that the volume is going to support that. Locomotives. Each locomotive is about two and a half million dollars. Uh, we're buying 500 locomotives. Our locomotive count on our system is going to be over 7,000 locomotives this year. A lot of those are leased, but if you look back a year and a half ago, it's about 4,500 locomotives. So we're significantly wrapping up our locomotive spend. And these new locomotives are more fuel efficient, they're more reliable, 
And um, you know, we just we just continue to feel pretty good about the business outlook, and that's why we're going to continue to buy more locomotives. We're buying new cars as well. That's not so relevant for, relevant for coal, but we, uh, you know, as these export terminals come online, a lot of people ask, well, how are you guys going to have the equipment? Well, you know, we're going to go out and buy equipment. We're going to go out and do long-term leases, but with the lead times that the panel talked about as export terminals, we're going to have the equipment in place to take care of the, um, you know, the export capacity. So just to talk about the northern tier, which where been where most of the growth has been, um, we're going to spend six hundred million dollars this year in additional sidings, line capacity, yard capacity, and sixty-six new miles of double track. So I think you're going to see. I talked before about the Chicago to Los Angeles is ninety-five percent double track. You're going to see a lot more of that going out to the export markets on the West Coast. Um, as, the, as the market grows, you're just going to see more double track, more triple track. We have to do it. We start talking about adding, you know, pick a number, cut, cut Andy's number in half, the, the 200 million tons, cut it in half. We've got to basically grow another railroad to haul another 100 million tons. And that's something our, our senior management is, is certainly willing to do, looks forward to doing it. So just to dial on coal exports to kind of give you guys a um, picture of what it means to be in itself. Today it's not really that big of a deal. Sorry, Tom, Tech. It, it, you know, it's 15 million tons on base, so, you know, 370 million tons, or 470 million tons. Um, you know, it, it, it's something that is very important for us. Obviously, the growth has been phenomenal, but, you know, we see the export of facilities coming online really being a game changer for us, obviously. Problem we have right now, though, been talked about is the export terminal capacity is limited on the West Coast, so we're, we're kind of capped on how much we can move, and we're pretty close to that cap right now. This also includes some going east, also, but you know, going west, we're pretty close to tapped out. We're, uh, you know, we see some productivity improvements at West Shore, keeping trains on the dumper. You know, that's the that's a big deal. They unload about eight trains a day. Uh, they they can unload eight trains a day, so it's up to us to make sure we keep trains on the dumpers so they can. Um, you know, keep those things active and keep coal going to the vessel. So we're we're focused on some productivity, but at the end of the day, the game changer is going to be getting these terminals built. So I'm not going to talk too much about this, the the West Coast export terminals we're talking about, but you know we we don't want to forget about the Atlantic Basin. It's you know it's residual. It's a small market. Today we move about two million tons of coal to. Um, East to the to the to Superior Wisconsin, <coughs> and from there it goes into Lake Vessels, and it goes to the Port of Quebec, where it's putting capes going to uh, to Northwest Europe. And you know that market obviously is in the tank in a big way, uh, but you know things change, market arbitrage opportunities present themselves. So we have we have capacity in that corridor. We have um, six river facilities that we serve in the Mississippi and Ohio River, and we have. Couple of places in Texas, the Kinder Morgan facilities that, that Arch works with, and we uh, we also are working with some of our joint line partners to hit some of the facilities in Louisiana. So uh, you know we don't want to forget about the Atlantic Basin. There may be some some arbitrage opportunities that present themselves, but our bread and butter is going to be the Pacific Rim where the growth is. I'm not going to go over this slide. This kind of restates what what you guys have seen before. But just to sum it up, I mean, the BNSF, we're very excited. I mean, we're very excited we're about the export potential. Um, we're willing to invest in that growth, and, uh, and we're, we're glad to have the, the, the board as a partner on this, and obviously the people at the, the table, and we, we uh, appreciate your support and look forward to working with you. With that, I guess I'll avoid opening up the question for the panel. Sure. Question for the board. Just one really easy question. What, with the WIA just, met, just recently receiving some direction from the legislation, legislature about supporting coal exports, what can we do to help? I guess is sort of the, the question, and 
it's in, I mean, it looks like there's lots of um, lots of things happening in the right direction, but notwithstanding that, there's some fairly significant headwinds. What can we do to help the uh, group? That would be probably maybe the best question for the board to um, hear and help us know where we can apply our resources. I'll take that one. You know, I think what the authority could help out with most um, in the immediate term would be uh, some visits possibly to Washington State. Um, we have invited uh, Lloyd to come out and see GPT uh, and to, for uh, Wyoming uh, folk to come out and talk in our communities about why are these projects important back in Wyoming and to educate, I think, is a critical step that. Um, that people need to understand that it's not just about Washington State's competitiveness, but it's about providing market access to Wyoming. So perhaps education missions, to the extent the authority would be willing to be involved in those, I think would be quite helpful. And I, I certainly agree. I think that that peer-to-peer -peer sort of connection is, is really quite important. I mean, there's, a, there's such a fantastic story here in Wyoming, the benefits that, that Wyoming has realized from, from the responsible management of its resources I think people in the Northwest don't really get that. I think that's, you know, when, when folks have come from the Northwest to visit uh, here in Wyoming, I think they've been blown away by uh, the way in which the, the communities and, and the coal uh, and the coal industry has partnered and what's been accomplished. And so I think that's that's uh, really quite significant. I also think, you know, that the whole message, I mean, we've got the world's fastest growing markets uh, in the Pacific Rim. And yes, we're talking about coal today, but the reality is that you know everything has a greenhouse gas footprint. And so if we build this wall along the West Coast that restricts the interior Western states from reaching those markets, uh, you know, how big of a concern is it? And I think the answer is it's, it's, it's a very significant concern. And I think that needs to be portrayed. I mean, you know, whether it's uh, legitimately and legally a commerce clause issue or not is for attorneys to determine. But, you know, really, we are talking about restricting access, I think, in a way that at least goes to the very heart of the concept of the Commerce Clause. So these are really important issues, and I agree that, that driving that message home to the people of Wyoming and to the office holders and the policymakers is really quite critical. And we appreciate all you've done so far, and would just encourage that continued dialogue. Well, I could just <clears throat> add to that. It, it is another voice, and it's a very important voice, and it's not unlike uh, some of the challenges that you've had to overcome just in areas of transmission. I mean, essentially it is BTUs that are exported out of Wyoming. Uh, I, I think there's another message. I think it's significant, sometimes it's subtle, uh, is that it's done responsibly. It's done with good stewardship. And um, I, I think there's uh, a lot of mis misperceptions and the misconceptions of, of coal. And, and I think as uh, as we go forward, education is a big part of that. And, and I agree with, uh, with the other panelists. Uh, the more that we can talk about uh, responsibility and stewardship and energy and all of the benefits, uh, it pushes against some of the voice of opposition, which seems to be constant. And we surge uh, once in a while, and we meet the level of the opposition, and then we fall off. The more voices that we have in that continuum, uh, the more press that we have against uh, the, uh, the opposition, the NGOs, the environmentalists, and, uh, and the like. I, I would just add to that as well. Um, we've invited um, the Seattle Times out to our coal mines to see them. It's not necessarily to get them on our side, but just to get them to say uh, a true story. Don't you don't need to make stuff up. And they and they were actually astounded by our minds. I mean, I think everybody saw yesterday or this morning in the news that Ireland, a coal mine, underground coal mine, killed 200 people. Well, they're going to take that. And they're going to assume that Wyoming has underground coal mines are going to kill all these. So, um, 
you need to promote the message like you're doing and keep doing what you're doing and, and invite people to come to our state so to see what we do. And they'll be very impressed because that's the response we got when we bring up to our minds. And I think that's a positive <coughs> message to send. Thank you guys. Question from the audience. I'm heading your way, Tom. Tom Dennis, um, great presentation on uh, the part of everybody on the panel. And Deck, it's great to see you again. And it's, I'm, I'm thrilled that they allowed you out of St. Louis. <laughs> Um, but I'd like to direct my first question to Deck, uh, who has a wealth of uh, public policy experience, and this is about his first rodeo, that's for sure. Um, one, a comment about how you see the politics in the Pacific Northwest, uh, both the, the, the practical side, and what I'd like to know is what keeps you up at night with respect to the permits that are required to get this job done? Thanks, Tom. Great, great to see you as, as well, and uh, great to be here in Wyoming. We do try to make that from time to time. But uh, you know, I certainly I would I would echo the sentiment, uh, you know, every sentiment that you know there is too much sort of this sort of surge mentality where we don't keep the flow of information and that and that you know the positive messaging as constant as we should. Because the reality is, as we discussed earlier, there really is good support for the projects. Out. I think we've done a pretty good job here of reaching out to those sort of those natural allies. You know, the labor community has really come around to support these projects. We have great relationships out there. They believe in what these projects can bring. The trade community certainly understands this, understands that, you know, yes, we might be talking about coal tomorrow today, but it could be any other commodity tomorrow. They have genuine concerns about a, uh, about you know a regulatory process that's getting sort of out of control a little bit, and, and you know it's just taking far too long to get anything permitted. Uh, there's I think a good understanding from the ad community that, uh, that the reality is that, that that if these these projects come in, they're going to help pay for additional rail capacity that can be utilized by a wide range of industries. I think we're doing a pretty good job on that. Again, yeah, I think, generally speaking, there's good support, not because they love coal, uh, but uh, to Joe's point, because they understand trade and how important trade is, and they've been down the, the spotted owl path, and they know how disruptive uh, it can be if there are, uh, you know, if you start to pick and choose uh, commodities. And so, I think there's good support, but I also think there's a very vocal minority that keeps the pressure on constantly, and, and we just need to guard uh, that and sort of try to combat that by bringing our allies into the fray and making them as passionate as the environmental community is about these projects. And that really is a significant goal. So I think in the long run, you know, this, this happens. I think that certainly there's nothing extraordinary about these projects. These are, you know, the, the, these are uh, good fundamental basic materials type projects. There's nothing unusual. The environmental impacts are actually quite minimal. Uh, and I think in the end we carry the day. But of course, uh, you know, we want to see that, you know, getting them done in 2025 is not success for our perspective. Uh, we want to see these done in the next five years, and we want to see the coal start to flow, because that's when we think the opportunity is going to really start to build. So I guess that would be, uh, uh, that'd be my perspective. Anybody else want to take a crack at that one? Thank you. Question here. This is somewhat of a segue to the question asked by Tom Dennis. Uh, there's a lot of focus in the discussion today with regard to the state of Washington. I'm curious, uh, what's the perception of eventually this becoming an issue in Washington, D.C.? Um, and what steps need to be taken to address that? Uh, are there steps being taken? Is that something that the panelists don't see as an issue? Again, it, it seems to me eventually this is where this, a lot of this will be played out, especially in light of some of the national environmental groups involved. Greg, at that one too. Um, certainly, I think today the coal export story is primarily still regional. Uh, yes, it gets talked about in, in DC, 
but I think right now, you know, Keystone obviously is a much bigger energy issue and one that's viewed as a national issue. Uh, exporting crude oil is starting to be on the radar. LNG exports. I think those are really dominating the conversation. But quite frankly, there's no question that coal kind of fits into that conversation. Are we going to participate in global markets? Are we going to take advantage of this incredible bounty we have in the U.S., these amazing resources, and participate in world markets in a way that's good for our balance of trade, that's good for our economy, uh, that, that actually allows us to participate in the world dialogue about energy in a much more robust way. Uh, and, and again, given that, you know, if you look at, at our mining requirements, it's simply, you know, mining is going to be conducted in a, in, a, in a more responsible way here in the U.S. than virtually anywhere else in the world. It's right, it's pretty good too. Uh, but I, I do think it ultimately becomes part of the conversation. Um, I, I don't know that, I mean, I think coal relative to oil is going to be a smaller piece. But I do think this whole conversation about uh, energy exports affects us, um, and certainly in the Northwest, as we've seen discussions about LNG, uh, you can see the, the focus migrate a little bit away from coal, and much more focus on the movement of crude oil and the exports of, of crude oil. So uh, certainly I think they're all interlinked, but I don't think we're there yet in terms of it becoming a significant part of the, of the national conversation. Other questions?